Soon dawn appeared and touched the sky with roses. Majestic, holy King Alcinous leapt out of bed, as did Odysseus, the city sacker. Then the blessed king, mighty Alcinous, led out his guests to the Phaeacian council by the ships. They sat there side by side on polished stones. Meanwhile, Athena walked all through the town, appearing like the royal messenger. To help Odysseus's journey home, she stood beside each man in turn and said, My lord, come to the meeting place to learn about the visitor to our king's home. Despite his wanderings by sea, he looks like an immortal god. So she roused up the hearts and minds of each, and soon the seats of the council were filled up. The men assembled. Seeing Laertes' clever son, the crowd marveled. Athena poured an earthly charm upon his head and shoulders, and she made him taller and sturdier so these Phaeacians would welcome him and respect him when he managed the many trials of skill that they would set to test him. When the people were assembled, Alcinous addressed them. Hear me, leaders and chieftains of Phaeacia. I will tell you the promptings of my heart. This foreigner, I do not know his name, came wandering from west or east and showed up at my house. He begs and prays for help to travel on. Let us assist him, as we have before with other guests. No visitor has ever been forced to linger in my house. We always give them safe passage home. Now let us launch a ship for her maiden voyage on the water and choose a crew of 52, the men selected as the best, and lash the oars besides the benches. Then return to the shore and come to my house. Let the young men hurry to cook a feast. I will provide supplies plenty for everyone. And I invite you also, lords, to welcome him with me. Do not refuse. We also must invite Demodocus, the poet. Gods inspire him, so any song he chooses to perform is wonderful to hear. He led the way. The lords went with him, and the houseboy fetched the bard. The 52 select young men went to the shore just as the king commanded. They reached the restless salty sea and launched the black ship on the depths, set up the mast and sails, and fastened in the oars by tying each to its leather thole strap, all in order. They spread the white sails wide and moored the ship out in the water. Then the men walked up towards the mighty palace of the king. The halls and porticos were thronged with people, both old and young. To feed his many guests, Alcinous killed 12 sheep and eight boars with silver tusks and two slow lumbering cows. Skinning the animals, they cooked a feast. The houseboy brought the poet whom the muse adored. She gave him two gifts, good and bad. She took his sight away, but gave sweet song. The wine boy brought a silver studded chair and propped it by a pillar in the middle of all the guests. And by a peg, he hung the poet's lyre above his head and helped him to reach it. And he set a table by him and a bread basket and a cup of wine to drink whenever he desired. They all took food. When they were satisfied, the muse prompted the bard to sing of famous actions an episode whose fame has touched the sky. Achilles and Odysseus's quarrel, how at a splendid sacrificial feast, they argued bitterly, and Agamemnon was glad because the best of the Achaeans were quarreling, since when he had consulted the oracle at Pitho, crossing over the entry stone, Apollo had foretold that this would be the start of suffering for Greeks and Trojans through the plans of Zeus. So sang the famous bard. Odysseus, with his strong hands, picked up his heavy cloak of purple, and he covered up his face. He was ashamed to let them see him cry. Each time the singer paused, Odysseus wiped tears, drew down the cloak, and poured a splash of wine out of his goblet for the gods. But each time, the Phaeacian nobles urged the bard to sing again. They loved his songs. So he would start again. Odysseus would moan and hide his head beneath his cloak. 
Only Alcinius could hear, could see his tears, since he was sitting next to him, and heard his sobbing, so he quickly spoke. My lords, we have already satisfied our wish for feasting in the lyre and the, the feast companion. Now let us go outside instead of contests in every sport, so when our guest goes home, he can tell all of his friends we are the best at boxing, wrestling, high jumping, and sprinting. With that, he led the way. The others followed. The boy took down the lyre from its peg and took Dem- Demodocus's uh, hand to lead him out with the crowd who went to watch the games. Many young athletes stood there. Acronius, Ocelius, Eleatris, Nadius, Thune, Ancalius, Eretmius, Anabesnius, and Pontius, uh, Primnius, Prorius, Amphilius, the son of Paulinius, son of Tecton, and Nobilus's son, Euralius, like Ares' cause of ruin. In his looks and strength, he was the best in all of Phacia, after Laodamus. Three sons of great Alcinius stood up. Laodamus, godlike Clytonius, and Halius first came the foot race. They lined up, then dashed all in an instant, right around the track so fast they raised the dust up from the field. Clytonius was the best by far at sprinting. He raced past all the others by the length of the field, plowed by mules, and reached the crowd. Next came the brutal sport of wrestling, in which Euralius was best. In jumping, Amphalius excelled, and at the discus, by far the best of all, was Elatrius. The prince Laodamus excelled at boxing. They all enjoyed the games. When they were over, Laodamus, Alcinius's son, said, Now, my friends, we ought to ask the stranger if he plays any sports. His build is strong, his legs and arms and neck are very sturdy, and he is in his prime, though he has been broken by suffering. No pain can shake a man as badly as the sea, however strong he once was. Euralius replied, You are quite right, Laodamus. Why not call out to challenge him yourself? The noble son of Alcinius agreed with him. He stood up in the middle of them all and called Odysseus. Come here, he said. Now you, sir, you should try our games as well. If you know any sports, it seems you would. Nothing can be more glorious for a man in a whole lifetime than what he achieves with hands and feet. So try. Set aside care. Soon you will travel since your ship is launched. The crew is standing by. Odysseus thought carefully. He had a plan. He answered, Laodamas, why mock me with this challenge? My heart is set on sorrow, not on games, since I have suffered and endured so much that now I only want to get back home. I sit here praying to your king and people to grant my wish. Euryalus responded with outright taunting. Stranger, I suppose you must be ignorant for all athletics. Um, I know your type. The captain of a crew of merchant sailors, you roam round at sea and only care about your freight and cargo. Keeping close watch on your ill-gotten games, you are no athlete. With a scowl, he answered, What crazy arrogance from you, stranger. The gods do not bless everyone the same, with equal gifts of body, mind, or speech. One man is weak, but gods may crown his words with loveliness. Men gladly look to him. His speech is steady, with calm dignity. He stands out from his audience, and when he walks through town, the people look at him as if he were a god. Another man has godlike looks, but no grace in his words. Like you, you look impressive, and a god could not improve your body, but your mind is crippled. You have stirred my heart to anger with these outrageous comments. I am not lacking experience of sports and games. When I was young, I trusted my strong arms and was among the first. Now pain has crushed me. I have endured the agonies of war and struggled through the dangers of the sea. But you have challenged me and stung my heart. Despite my suffering, I will compete. With that, he leapt up, cloak and all, and seized a massive discus, heavier than that used by the others. He spun around, drew back his arm, and from his brawny hand he hurled. The stone went humming. The fey Achaeans, known for rowing, ducked down cowering beneath its arc. It flew beyond the other pegs. Athena marked the spot. In human guides, she spoke. A blind man, stranger, could discern this mark by groping. It is far ahead of all the others. You can celebrate. You won this round, and none of them will ever throw further or as far. Odysseus was thrilled to realize he had a friend to take his side 
and with a lighter heart, he told the young um, Phaeacians, try to match this. If you can do it, I will throw another, as far or farther. You have made me angry, so I will take you on in any sport. Come on, in boxing, wrestling, or sprinting, I will compete with anyone except Laodimus. He is my host, who would fight with a friend. A man who challenges those who have welcomed him in a strange land is worthless and a fool. He spites himself. But I will challenge any of you others. Test my ability. Let me know yours. I am not weak at any sportman practice. I know the way to hold and polish a bow. I always was the first to hit my man out of a horde of enemies, though many comrades stood by me, arrows taking aim. At Troy, when the Anchises shot their bows, the only one superior to me was Philotides. Other men who eat their bread on earth are all worse shots than me. I will not compete with super archers, with Heracles or Eutrys, who was competing with the gods at archery. And Paulo was enraged at him and killed him as soon as he proposed it. He died young and did not reach old age in his own home. And I can throw a spear beyond the shots that others reach with arrows. I'm only concerned that one of you may win the foot race. I lost my stamina, and my legs weakened during the, my time at sea. Upon the raft, I could not do my exercise routine. The crowd was silent. But now the key said, Sir, you have expressed with fine good manners your wish to show your talents, and your anger at the man who stood up in this arena and mocked you, as no one who understands how to speak properly would ever do. Now listen carefully, so you may tell your own fine friends at home when you are feasting beside your wife and child, and remember our skill at all the deeds we've accomplished from our forefathers' time until now. We are not brilliant at wrestling or boxing, but we are quick at sprinting, and with chips we are the best. We love the feast, the lyre, dancing in varied clothes, hot baths and bed. But now let the best dancers of Phoenicia perform so that our guest may tell his friends when he gets home how excellent we are at seafaring, at running, and at dancing, and song. Let someone bring the well-tuned lyre from inside for Demacos. Go quickly. So spoke the king. The house boy brought the lyre. The people chose nine referees to check the games were fair. They leveled out a floor for dancing with a fine wide ring around. The houseboy gave Democus the lyre. He walked into the middle, flanked by boys, young and well-trained, who tapped their feet performing the holy dance, their quick legs bright with speed. Odysseus was wonderstruck to see it. The poet strummed and sang a charming song about the love of fair-crowned Aphrodite for Ares, who gave lavish gifts to her and shamed the bed of Lord Hephaestus. When they secretly had sex, the sun god saw them and told Hephaestus bitter news for him. He marched into his forge to get revenge and set the mighty anvil on its block. It hammered chains so strong that they could never be broken or undone. He was so angry at Ares. When his trap was made, he went inside the room of his beloved bed. In the twined mass of cables all around the bedpost, and then hung them from the ceiling like slender spiderwebs. So finally made that nobody could see them. Even God's, the craftsman, was so ingenious. When he had set the trap across the bed, he traveled to the cultured town of Lemnos, which was his favorite place in all the world. Ares, the golden rider, had kept watch. He saw Hephaestus, famous wonder worker, leaving his house and went inside himself. He wanted to make love with Aphrodite. She had returned from visiting her father, the mighty son of Kronos. There she sat. Then Ares took her hand and said to her, my darling, let us go to bed. Hephaestus is out of town. He must have gone to Lemnos to see the Scythians whose speech is strange. She was excited to lay down with him. They went to get to bed together, but the chains ingenious Hephaestus had created wrapped tight around them so they could not move or get up. Then they knew that they were trapped. The limping god drew near. Before he reached the land of Lemnos, he had turned back home. Troubled at heart, he came toward his house. Standing there in the doorway, he was seized by savage rage. He gave a mighty shout, calling to all the gods, O oh, Father Zeus, 
and all you blessed gods who live forever. Look, you may laugh, but it is hard to bear. See how my Aphrodite, child of Zeus, is disrespecting me for being lame. She loves destructive Ares, who is strong and handsome. I am weak. I blame my parents. If only I had not been born. But come, see where those two are sleeping in my bed as lovers. I am horrified to see it. But I predict they will not want to lie longer like that, however great their love. Soon they will want to wake up, but my trap and chains will hold them fast until her father pays back the price I gave him for his daughter. Her eyes stare at me like a dog. She is so beautiful, but lacking self-control. The gods assembled at his house, Poseidon, Earthshaker, helpful Hermes, and Apollo. The goddesses stayed home from modesty. The blessed gods who give good things were standing inside the doorway and they burst out laughing at what a clever trap Hephaestus set. And as they looked, they said to one another, crime does not pay. The slow can beat the quick. As now Hephaestus, who is lame and slow, has used his skill to catch the fastest sprinter of all those on Olympus. Ares owes the price for his adultery, they gossiped. Apollo, son of Zeus, then said to Hermes, Hermes, my brother, would you like to sleep with golden Aphrodite in her bed, even weighed down by mighty chains? And Hermes, the sharp-eyed messenger, said, Ah, brother, Apollo, lord of archery, if only. I would be bound three times as tight or more and let you gods and all your wives look on if only I could sleep with Aphrodite. Then laughter rose among the deathless gods. Only Poseidon did not laugh. He begged and pleaded with Hephaestus to release Ares. He told the wonder-working god, now let him go. I promise he will pay the penalty in full among the gods, just you ask. The famous limping god replied, Poseidon, do not ask me this. It is disgusting bailing scoundrels out. How could I bind you while the gods look on if Ares should escape his bonds and debts? Poseidon, lord of earthquakes, answered him, Hephaestus, if he tries to dodge this debt, I promise I will pay. The limping god said, then in courtesy to you, I must do as you ask. So using all his strength, Hephaestus loosed the chains. The pair of lovers were free from their constraints and both jumped up. Ares went off to Thrace while Aphrodite smiled as she went to Cyprus, to the island of Paphos, where she had a fragrant altar and sanctuary. The graces washed her there and rubbed her with magic oil that glows upon immortals and they dressed her up in gorgeous clothes. She looked astonishing. That was the poet's song. Odysseus was happy listening, so were they all. And then Alcinous told Halius to dance with Laodomus. No one danced as well as them. They took a purple ball which Polybus the artisan had made them. One boy would leap and toss it to the clouds, the other would jump up, feet off the ground, and catch it easily before he landed. After they practiced throwing it straight upwards, they danced across the fertile earth, crisscrossing, constantly trading places. Other boys who stood around the field were beating time with noisy stomping. Then Odysseus said, King of many citizens, great lord, you boasted that your dancers are the best, and it is true. I feel amazed to see this marvelous show. That pleased the reverend king. He spoke at once to his seafaring people. Hear me, Phaeacian leaders, lords, and nobles. The stranger seems extremely wise to me. So let us give him gifts, as hosts should do to guests in friendship. Twelve lords rule our people with me as thirteenth lord. Let us each bring a pound of precious gold and laundered clothes, a tunic and a cloak. Then pile them up and let our guest take all of these gifts and go to dinner with them, happy in his heart. Euryala should tell him he is sorry and give a special gift, since what he said was inappropriate. They all agreed, and each sent back a deputy to fetch the presents, and Euryala spoke out, My lord Alcinous, great of kings, I will apologize as you command. And I will give him this bronze sword, which has a silver handle and a scabbard carved of ivory, a precious gift for him. With that, he put the silver studded sword into Odysseus's hands. His words flew out. I welcome you, sir. Be our guest. If something rude of any kind was said, let the winds take it. May the gods allow you to reach your home and see your wife again, since you have suffered so long far away from those you love. And Odysseus said, friend, I wish you well. 
May gods protect you, and may you never miss the sword you gave me. With that, he strapped the silver-studded sword across his back, and as the sun went down, the precious gifts were brought to him. The slaves took them inside Elkinus' house. The princes piled the lovely things beside the queen, their mother. King Elkinus let everyone inside and had them sit in upright, on upright chairs. He told Arete, Wife, bring out our finest chest and put inside it a tunic and a freshly laundered cloak. Set a bronze cauldron on the fire to boil so he can take a bath. Then let him see the precious gifts our noblemen have brought, and then enjoy the banquet and the song. I also have a gift, a splendid cup of gold. I hope he always thinks of me whenever he pours offerings to Zeus and other gods. Of my life. With that, he went to sit beside the king. Now they were serving out food and pouring wine, and the steward led out to the center Democritus, the well-respected poet. He sat him in the middle of the banquet against a pillow. Then Odysseus thought fast and sliced a helping from the pig, all, rich, all richly laced with fat. The plate of meat had plenty left. He told the boy, Go, take this meat and give it to Democritus. Despite my grief, I would be glad to meet him. Poets are honored by all those who live on earth. The muse has taught them how to sing. She loves the race of poets. So the houseboy handed it to Democritus. He took it gladly, and everybody took their food. When they had enough to eat and drink, the clever mastermind of many schemes said, You are wonderful, Democritus. I praise you more than anyone. Apollo, or else the muse, the child of Zeus, has taught you. You tell so accurately what the Greeks achieved and what they suffered there at Troy, as if you had been there or heard about it from somebody who was. So sing the story about the wooden horse, which Apesius built with Athena's help. Odysseus dragged it inside into the citadel, filled up with men to sack the town. If you can tell that as it happened, I will say that you are truly blessed with inspiration. A god inspired the bard to sing. He started with how the Greeks set fire to their camp, and then embarked and sailed away. Meanwhile, Odysseus brought in a gang of men into the heart of Troy, inside the horse. The Trojans pulled the thing up to the summit and sat around discussing what to do. Some said, we ought to strike the wood with swords. Others said, drag it higher up and hurl it down from the rocks. But some said they should leave it to pacify the gods. So it would be. The town was doomed to ruin when it took that horse, chock full of fighters bringing death to Trojans. And he sang how the Achaeans poured from the horse in ambush from the hollow and sacked the city. How they scattered out, destroying every neighborhood. Like Ares, Odysseus with Menelaus rushed to find Deiphobus' house. And there he won at last through dreadful violence, thanks to Athena. So the poet sang. Odysseus was melting into tears. His cheeks were wet with weeping as a woman weeps as she falls to wrap her arms around her husband fallen fighting for his home and children. She is watching as he gasps and dies. She shrieks a high, clear wail, collapsing upon his corpse. The men are right behind. They hit her shoulders with their spears and lead her to slavery, hard labor, and a life of pain. Her face is marked with her despair. In that same desperate way, Odysseus was crying. No one noticed that his eyes were wet with tears except Alcinous, who sat right next to him and heard his sobs. Quickly, he spoke to his seafaring people. Listen, my lords and nobles of Phaeacia, Demodocus should stop and set aside the lyre, since what he sings does not give pleasure to everyone. Throughout this heavenly song since dinnertime, our guest has been in pain, grieving. A heavy burden weighs his heart. Let the song end so we can all be happy both guests and hosts. That would be best by far. This send off party and these precious gifts, which we give out of friendship are for him, our guest of honor. Any man of sense will treat a guest in need like his own brother. Stranger, now answer all my questions clearly, not with evasion, frankness would be best. What did your parents name you? With what name are you known to your people? Surely no one in all the world is nameless, poor or noble, since parents give a name to every child at birth. And also tell me your country, your people and your city, so our ships steered by their own good sense may take you there. Phaeacians have no need of men at helm nor rudders as in other ships. Our boats intuit what is in the minds of men 
and know all human towns and fertile fields. They rush at full tilt right across the gulf of salty sea, concealed in mist and clouds. They have no fear of damages or loss. But once I heard Nisithus, my father, say that Poseidon hates us for the help we give to take our guests across the sea, and that one day a ship of ours would suffer shipwreck on its return. A mighty mountain would block our town from sight. So father said, perhaps the God will bring these things to pass or not, as is his will. But come now, tell me about your wanderings. Describe the places, the people, and the cities you have seen. Which ones were wild and cruel, unwelcoming? and which were kind to visitors, respecting the gods. And please explain why you were crying, sobbing your heart out when you heard him sing what happened to the Greeks at Troy. The gods devised and measured out this devastation to make a song for those in times to come. Did you lose somebody at Troy? A man from your wife's family? Perhaps her father or brother? Ties of marriage are the closest after the bonds of blood. Or else perhaps you lost the friend who knew you best of all. A friend can be as close as any brother. <laughs>